contractors. I would like to announce a, a small change in the schedule. So today's event will conclude with a, a recap session and some concluding remarks. So we will hear those concluding remarks right <laughs> after the end of the lectures, just before lunch. Right? So at the end of the, today's three lectures, please save the room for your concluding remarks and then we'll go on to the lunch. Okay. All right. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Marius Zacharias. Um, from the University of Rennes in France, who is going to talk about the, the special displacement method for calculating optical and other properties of materials. Paris. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So, yeah, welcome to the fifth day of the Electrophone of Physics School. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and presenting the special displacement. Is it okay? Now, better? Great. So yeah, it's my pleasure to be here and presenting the special displacement method. Uh, before I start, I would like to send my greetings to my wife. I just got recently married uh, on Sunday. So, and she's watching right now from Cyprus. So yeah. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about the special displacement method, which is a non perturbative approach. It's a method quite different from the electron, uh, like APW approaches, where they rely on perturbative approaches for incorporating the effect of electron coupling uh, in ab initial calculations. And so today I'll talk about non perturbative approaches and how we can calculate uh, electron phono mediated properties uh, using supercell approaches. Here's a small uh, lecture summary. So first I will introduce non perturbative approaches to electron coupling. Then I will describe how we can go from the stochastic framework. Okay. Then we can start uh, talking about, uh, we can go, we can see how we can go from the stochastic framework and the important sampling method to the deterministic uh, approach where we can use the special displacement method. And I will gradually introduce a special displacement method with some remarks about the theory, and then I'll demonstrate its physical interpretation. That is not just a numerical trick. And finally, I will show some applications of the method. So there are several codes for perturbative and non-perturbative approaches. As you can see here is EPW or ABINIT can be used uh, to calculate the electrophone matrix elements from density function of perturbation theory using the unit cell within the unit cell. And then with EPW, you can do a venier interpolation to get the electrophone matrix elements in very fine Q grids. When you use non perturbative approaches, supercell approaches, your Q grid is limited to the supercell size. And here I list a few codes that rely on supercell approaches for computing uh, temperature dependent properties. And in these uh, supercell approaches, we do not evaluate the electrophone matrix elements explicitly, uh, but we incorporate the electrophone coupling effect by just displacing the nuclei. In, in the supercell to mimic thermal vibrations. So all these non perturbative approaches have a common goal to evaluate the temperature dependence of the observable as a trace uh, over the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian weighted by a Boltzmann factor. Here, if we replace, for example, the observable with the transition rate from an electronic state alpha to, an to a final electronic state beta, uh, this trace can be expanded as summation over the nuclear states. Here, the exponential factor now it's the Boltzmann factor with the energies of the uh, system. And then here we have also the partition function. So all non perturbative approaches, they are trying to evaluate this expression. One can use path integral molecular dynamics, which rely on the quantum mechanical description of the nuclei based on the Feynman path integral representation. One can also use molecular dynamics, but here nuclei are treated classically. Uh, other methods is the important sampling method, which I will talk a bit uh, later which is a method where you can stochastically generate configurations from a multi-dimensional Gaussian distribution and evaluate temperature dependent properties. Then is the quantum Monte Carlo method, which is a bit more sophisticated and more accurate, but relatively expensive. Then we have the thermal lines, which is a very clever trick for minimizing and reducing the vibrational, uh, the, the phase points in the vibrational phase space. And the special displacement method where you can use only one single uh, configuration for evaluating temperature dependent properties and incorporate the effect of electrophono coupling. There are also some other approaches where you can use finite differences to do this type of calculations. And here I tried to be a little bit exhaustive with the reference list, but if I forgot someone, uh, I hope he forgives me or she forgives me. So 
All non-perturbative approaches can be upgraded to evaluate essentially any property that can be written as a fermi golden rule. For today's lecture, I'm going to, to talk more about the temperature-dependent band structures and phono-assisted optical absorptions. But here there are examples where you can use uh, non-perturbative approaches for evaluating the tunneling spectra or the current density or transport coefficients here. It's the example of mobility. And they work quite well, to be honest. So starting from the phono-assisted optical absorption that Manos introduced very nicely on his uh, lecture on Wednesday, here we can see that the electron, uh, like the electron lying at the valence band top wants to make an indirect transition in the band structure of silicon uh, to the conduction band bottom, which lies in a different K point in the momentum space. So for having the transition from the valence band top to the conduction band bottom, the electron absorbs a photon, makes a direct transition, and then needs to interact with the photon to complete the indirect transition. So this procedure has been described by the Holbert in blood theory, which has been developed in 1954. And inside the square uh, modulus, we have the two terms guiding the phono-assisted transitions. P is the optical matrix elements. G is the standard electrophono matrix elements. And in the denominator, we have the consham energies, the photon energy. And in the other term, we have also plus minus the phonon energy, which accounts for phonon emission and phonon absorption. Inside the delta function, we, have, uh, we ensure that we, cons uh, conserve the, uh, we have energy conservation. And we have the conscious states, the phonon energy, and the photon energy. The first implementation of this equation appeared in the literature back in 2012 by, by Manos and Nofsiger, uh, where they have calculated the phonon assisted spectra of silicon. They compare with experiment, and we can see here an excellent agreement and was like a huge success actually, having so uh, like that good agreement with experiment actually. <coughs> However, as Manos pointed out, in order to capture the correct absorption onset at finite temperatures, we need to introduce an empirical shift for capturing the correct absorption onset. And this is because if you see in the, in the delta function, we do not have any temperature dependence of the energy levels. In order to account for the temperature dependence of the energy levels, a consistent theory for doing this is the allen ein theory. And people usually implement this expression, where here is the energy level normalization of the conscious state, Consham state and inside the square brackets, we have the self energy term and the Debye Waller term. The Debye Waller term is second derivatives of the self consistent potential with respect to the nuclear coordinates. And inside the brackets, you have the Bose Einstein distribution, uh, the Bose Einstein occupation factor for the phonons. So this expression has been implemented throughout the years. It's been like 50 years that people uh, are using this expression to evaluate. Uh, uh, temperature dependent band structures. Some people use the adiabatic version or some other people the non-adiabatic versions. So usually they compare. They, there might be some differences here. I just wrote uh, down the adiabatic version. And when you apply the allen Eine theory for the case of silicon, like conventional semiconductors, silicon and gallium arsenide, we see that we have a band gap closing. So the valve band top uh, rises in energy while the conduction band bottom lowers in energy. And here we see that we get a renormalization of the band gap. This band gap closing will become more important with increasing temperature. Here we see the case of gallium arsenide. So now if we think in terms of optical absorption, if we could have a method that we could incorporate this band gap renormalization, this energy level renormalization inside the delta function, we could capture precisely the the correct absorption onset because this band gap closing would lead to a redshift of the spectra, like here. So we don't need the empirical shift. So we thought and we tried to find the literature a method that can incorporate both phono-assisted transitions and energy level normalization. And this is the williams lux theory. It's also the starting point of our special displacement method. So I'll give a brief description about the williams lux theory and then I will introduce a special displacement method. So the starting point of the williams lux theory is the herzberg teller rate. So we have here transitions uh, from an initial electronic state to a final electronic state. And we sum here over the all final nuclear uh, states where mu index is for the nuclear state. And chi here are the nuclear wave functions and p are the electro like the optical matrix elements uh, representing the optical transition. Inside the delta function, now we have the joint electron nuclear energy of like the final and the initial states. The basic approximation in the Williams Lux theory is this same classical approximation, which allows us to replace the joint electron nuclear energy with the adiabatic potential energy surface. So now the electrons being in state 
beta, let's say, follow the nuclei adiabatically. And, and here we represent the position of the nuclei with this uh, superscript X. So this allows us to perform, when you do this approximation, you lift actually the index M, and that allows you to do the summation over the final nuclear uh, wave functions, and you get rid of uh, the final states, and you end up with this expression, this same classical expression from, for the transition rate. This approximation is well justified for extended systems because uh, for extended system, the final states for transition, the final available states for transition will have large quantum numbers. So based on the uh, correspondence principle, uh, we can treat them as classical continuous variables. A more rigorous justification for this approximation is involves neglecting some kinetic energy commutators. And you can find, if someone is interested on the rigorous derivation, you can find it in this reference here. In my thesis, I have it like step-by-step step how someone can go from here to here. Then the procedure for getting the, uh, the temperature dependence is, involves taking the thermal average, employing the harmonic approximation, and therefore consider uh, uh, independent quantum harmonic oscillators, and then apply the Michler's formula, which is a nice formula. That we give you this nice expression here, this multidimensional Gaussian integral. So here you have a Gaussian, here are the optical matrix elements depending on the nuclear coordinates and also a delta function with the energies again depending on the nuclear coordinates. Sigma, which is the width of the Gaussian, is the mean square displacement of the atoms along a particular phonon mode nu. And N is the Bose Einstein uh, occupation factor for the phonons. L is the zero point amplitude for each mode. So this depends on the phonon energies. So now to make contact with DFT, because we talk about potential energy surfaces, if you just consider again a solid, an extended system, taking the difference between the uh, potential energy surfaces of the final and initial state, you can write this difference as the difference between uh, the excited state, which is the consham uh, state of the conduction band, minus the energy of the valence band. So doing this, also the similar approach for the optical matrix elements, you can end up with an equation for the temperature dependence of the dielectric function. So here, we choose to describe the dielectric function in the simplest possible case, which is the independent particle approximation. But someone can, of course, go like higher levels and use BSC or like a random phase approximation. So yeah, having this expression here, the way we interpret it is that this expression is simply a weighted average of the spectra evaluated uh, in a variety of configurations. So what I mean, a variety of configurations. We generate normal coordinates from this Gaussian distribution. So it's like, you know, you have a distribution and you pick up coordinates based on the temperature and the frequency of the mode. And then you generate displaced configurations. So using this concept, we apply this important sampling Monte Carlo method, the stochastic method for the case of silicon, like what Kupakis uh, has done. So we have like very nice data also to benchmark with the theory and experiment. So first we have calculated the spectra uh, uh, using the nuclei clamped at their equilibrium position. So now we don't have any, uh, any displacements of the atoms. And you see, this is the result for the red line. You see that this is the direct gap energy of silicon represented by the gray line. We have simply no absorption below, like some absorptions comes from the Gaussian broadening introduced in the calculations. And this is because we don't include any phonon assisted transition. So we cannot have a transition from the balance band top to the conduction band meaning. However, when we include, uh, when we account for nuclear displacements, we see that we can include phonon assisted transitions precisely and they match correctly the absorption onset. We don't really need to shift the spectra. Okay, we do shift it because of, we need to account for GW quasi particle effects, but not because of the uh, of, of thermal effects. So here we see that we have excellent agreement with experiment and some deviations between theory and experiment are coming mainly due to the fact that we don't include excitonic effects. So someone pointed out yesterday, ah, you know why you don't include excitonic effects? What's the effect? Mostly the effect will be this distribution of the oscillator strengths around the direct gap energy. And this will breach like basically like we eliminate any disagreement between theory and experiment. Nobody has done that, but I guess this would be the answer for that. So now, because we use important sampling Monte Carlo, we generated a variety of configurations, as I said before. Uh, here I show the example and I comment on the convergence of the optical spectra. 
So using six configurations and taking the average, and here note that we are using a large supercell. It's an eight by eight by eight supercell. So someone, if, you, if someone uses a four by four by four supercell, for example, he will need more configurations to get the convergence. Uh, but we found out that as we are increasing the supercell size, even only a single configuration can do the job. So that was fantastic. I remember Philip Charles back in my PhD, he was like, whoa, oh, wow, that's uh, great news. So what, what should we do like, to, to, to understand why this is happening? Uh, so we said that, uh, let's say, take the expansion, a Taylor expansion, and write the williams lux theory uh, as a Taylor expansion. What would happen? So now think about it that here we have a multidimensional integration and we have the dielectric function depending on the nuclear coordinates. So you simply take a Taylor expansion with respect to the nuclear coordinates and perform the multidimensional integration. This will give you uh, the result here, this first equation. This is the exact williams lux dielectric function when you uh, expand the dielectric function as a Taylor expansion. So we said, can we generate one single configuration? And under what conditions this single configuration will give the exact williams lux dielectric function? Here we took the expansion and we have this second order term, the second order coupling coefficients. And here we see that we have some cross terms that do not take into account in the williams lux theory. So what would be the recipe to kill these cross coupling terms? We said we put the eigen modes and the phonon modes in ascending order in energy. And then we simply alternate the signs. This, by alternating the signs, will kill the cross coupling terms for different branch indices. So nu and mu here are like the branch indices. We also said the nuclear coordinates, we don't generate them from the Gaussian distribution, but we say that they should be equal to the mean square displacement of the atoms, because this is what Williams Lux theory says. So we do this simple uh, expansion, then we determine the signs. And this will give precisely the williams lux dielectric function in the large supercell limit, in the thermodynamic limit. So we, could, we choose to, to call this method the special displacement method. And the displacements that account for the special displacement method, we call them ZG. So here is like the displacements, which is basically a normal coordinate transformation with respect to the nuclear coordinates. We choose the nuclear coordinates to be sigma. This is the phonon polarization vectors. And here we include the signs that we are determined by this comparison here. So that essentially will make the trick. So we said we will test the special displacement method for phonon assisted optical absorption. We have, re 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 we have redone silicon and diamond here with the red lines. It's the phonon assisted optical spectra. Gray spheres are like uh, this are the experiment. We see that in general, we capture the correct absorption onset. We capture transitions below the direct gap for the case of diamond and silicon. And some deviations between theory and experiment are still attributed to the fact that we are not using, uh, we are not accounting for quasi-particle effects or excitonic effects. <coughs> now, because when I discuss with people, there's some confusion, uh, non-perturbative approaches and perturbative approaches in their adiabatic, their adiabatic version, let's say, they should be equivalent. So these coefficients that I have described here, this, the second order coefficient with respect to nuclear coordinates, they should give precisely, if you take the, the, the perturbative expansion of the wave functions, for example, they should give precisely the whole Bartin and Blatt theory, the perturbative approach. Also, in a similar spirit, you can do uh, the same expansions when you account for temperature dependent band structures, and you will get the Allen Eine theory, the adiabatic version of the Allen Eine theory. The bad news with the perturbative approaches is that we don't have the phonon frequencies in the denominators, while Paul Baltin and Blatt theory for phonon assisted transition has it, or the non adiabatic version of the Allen theory. But this approximation should be okay when the band gap is relatively large compared to the phonon frequencies, to the mean phonon frequency, let's say. We can also capture, but the good news for these approach, uh, approaches, non perturbative approaches, is that we capture terms beyond quadratic order in nuclear displacement. So essentially we include electron multiphonon interactions in our calculations. So for silicon and diamond might be not that important, but for other materials, they might be. And also we include off diagonal the by waller terms and we don't rely on the rigid ion approximation. So now, uh, back in 2022 years ago, uh, we have developed basically the formal uh, 
equations for the special displacement methods, starting from the unit cell and using a reciprocal space formulation. So we said, if we can calculate the phonons from density fractional perturbation theory, can we generate our displacements? The answer is yes. So here we have the polarization vectors calculated from uh, density fractional perturbation theory, sigma, which depends basically on the phonon frequencies, and the rest is like the Bose-Einstein incubation factor, the temperature of interest. So you have this information already, and this is the standard phase factor. Uh, between the Q wave vector, the phono wave vector, and the unit cell position in the supercell. And we have here the signs. Before, we didn't have any wave vector dependence. Now, we have a wave vector dependence because we do the reciprocal space formulation. <coughs> here, the summation is taken over uh, modes that belong in set B. So what is this set B? We said that because if the system uh, has time reversal, then Q points uh, in set B will be the points that they do not have any time reversal partner, actually. So, they, so we restrict those uh, Q points indicated here by open circles. And then we have the Q points in point C, which are like the time reversal partners of, of Q points in set B. So this, when you do the summation, they will give you exactly the same contribution. So instead of doing the summation inside the two sets, we said we multiply by two. They will give the same result as long time reversal exists. And then it's like the Q points is set A. So we chose to isolate these Q points because they do not have time reversal partners and they have a finite contribution in our supercell calculations. And this contribution will go out, will go away as we are increasing the supercell size. <coughs> so the two key findings from our theory is that the linear order derivatives vanish in a supercell calculation. This can be proved very easily when you actually uh, take into account translational variance of the lattice. So linear order terms vanish. So we are done with that. We don't really care how, we don't really care how to, to you know, cancel these contributions that they do not uh, uh, like contribute in the williams lacks electric function. The other bit is that, which is uh, fantastic actually. So when you do again, translational variance of the lattice, we see that the cross coupling terms having different wave vectors, Q and Q prime, again, they will vanish. So what we are left and what we really want to kill here is that the cross coupling terms that they have different branch index, nu and nu prime. So this simplifies the problem a lot. And actually we found out that without doing any extra DFT calculations and relying only on density functional perturbation theory um, derivatives like phonon, uh, phonon frequencies and phonon polarization vectors, we can minimize this function based on the choice of the signs and the size and the signs we found that they can be chose combinatorially in order to reduce this uh, function. <coughs> and inside the code, the zg.x code that we'll learn how to use uh, in exercise one and two for the tutorial, we minimize this expression. And after the, this expression goes below a threshold, a predetermined threshold, here it's like 5%, we say that, okay, code, please generate the configuration. And then this configuration can be used to uh, uh, like perform a temperature dependent calculations using any app initial code essentially. So as I said, no extra DFT calculations are required to determine the optimum configuration. Uh, then here now I point, uh, like uh, I make a point about uh, applying a smooth berry connection of the Aiken modes. So this point is important because choosing signs for the Aiken modes, if you don't have your Aiken vectors aligned, it's, it's a bit pointless. So before applying this smooth very connection, you will see that the Aiken vectors, <coughs> because when you diagonalize the dynamical matrix, will have a random phase factor in front. You see that the Aiken vectors here, some of them are like perfectly aligned, but some of them are like pointing in any like different direction. So we do apply a transformation for the Aiken vectors so that they are perfectly aligned. So here you see before applying the alignment and after applying the alignment, you see that all Aiken vectors, they vary smoothly with uh, like uh, the Q vector. And also we need to choose a path inside the brilliant zone, like for our Q point, so that we ensure locality of our phonons. So locality, I mean that the, like the phonon wave vectors should be close to each other so that the, the phonon frequencies and phonon polarization vectors are also similar. So here we choose this path, which ensures locality is the simplest path someone can choose. So here is like a small flowchart of what the code is doing. 
So first you need to do PW.x calculation to calculate the self-consistent uh, charge density in the unit cell in the ground state. And then you evaluate the teratomic force constants using density functional perturbation theory with ph.x and q2r.x. Someone can also use interatomic force constants from any other code. Let's say uh, if someone wants to use frozen form approach, it's welcome, but he needs to you know, convert the format, the appropriate format for the zg.x. Then using the zg.x, you can generate the displaced configurations. Actually, the code generates an SCF file for you with the required superset size. So you can just get this file and do an SCF calculation and then calculate any observable that you would like that can be described by the fermi golden rule uh, with uh, any quantum espresso routine or maybe other codes. So <coughs> we have demonstrated the mathematical meaning of the special displacement method, like the logic behind it seems to be okay. So is there a physical meaning of this thing or is just you know, a numerical mathematical trick? So actually there is a physical meaning. Um, Zenglu was asking me yesterday, actually, what's the physical meaning? Uh, this configuration will give, like if you plot the probability distribution of the nuclear positions, you will get a Gaussian distribution, which is the exact result predicted by quantum mechanics. So blue is the exact result, green is a histogram, and you see that the two overlay perfectly. Now, another thing, nice thing to show the concept is that if you generate a large supercell with displaced configurations and then fold them back in the unit cell, you'll see that here you'll get, for silicon, you'll get some spheres. So these spheres, they represent the thermal ellipsoids. And the thermal ellipsoids for a cubic structure like silicon, they should be spheres. So if you have a different symmetry, let's say tetragonal, you'll get some ellipsoids, actual ellipsoids, not spheres. So this points out basically the, some of the physical meaning of the a special displacement method. <laughs> Here I also plot the mean square displacement of the atoms because the special displacement method, the way the signs are, are attributed and the way the, the error function is minimized is such that it gives the correct anisotropic displacement tensor. So here for MOS2, we calculated the mean square displacement method based on the special displacement method and the exact result from density functional perturbation theory, the two give identical results. And also here I plot the thermal ellipsoids, how they should look like. Another point for demonstrating the physical meaning of the special displacement method is that indeed these ZG displacements, they give the best collection of scatterers, the best possible positions that they will reproduce the phono induced in elastic scattering patterns. So think about you do an electron diffraction or X-ray diffraction and you send a, 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 like, let's say the, the, the particle on the sample and this scatters inelastically and you collect the intensity on the detector, you'll see this so-called diffuse scattering patterns. It's something that we do like in the undergrad level for solid state physics. But what we usually do is that for the Bragg scattering. So this is the blue peaks is the Bragg scattering. And the red uh, coloring here represents the phonon induced in elastic scattering, okay? <coughs> Sorry, so here we have developed a method for calculating uh, uh, the phonon the diffuse in elastic scattering in these two references here. And we actually, in our method, we include also multiphonal contributions. So here we, did, we divide the two in one phonon scattering and multiphonal scattering. You see that these red stripes in black phosphorus, this is black phosphorus. You see that these red the diffuse scattering patterns in black phosphorus coming from multiphonal contribution. Now, if we join the two, one phonon plus multiphonon, and we have the old phonon, this is the exact result coming from the laval ball james theory. Now, coming back to the ZG theory. Here, usually the inelastic scattering pattern can be evaluated with this simple expression, where F is the atomic scattering factor and this exponential, where you have the scattering vector, a dot of the scattering vector and the uh, atomic positions. If you forget about the ZG displacements here, you'll get only the Bragg peaks. You'll get only blue coloring here. But if you account for the special displacement method, like the displacements, you'll see that you will reproduce the exact result and also the experiment. So this is another good example to show the physical significance of this special displacement method. It really reproduces the phonon inducing elastic scattering patterns, the thermalized ones, uh, and that someone will see in an X-ray diffraction or electrodiffraction experiment. So 
Now coming for the application of the special displacement method. This is the first example that we will show in exercise two, where we will do temperature dependent band structure using the band structure faulting technique. So because we are using supercells, of course, our bands would be faulted inside the smaller brillouin zone. So here I use just you know, an example of the 222 supercell, and you see that L prime and X prime represent points in the brillouin zone of the supercell, which is smaller. So if we want to do uh, to reproduce the band structure in the fundamental brillouin zone of the unit cell, we need to unfold them. So we, you need to take this band here outside the brillouin zone of the supercell. So now if you think about uh, accounting for special displacements in a supercell, this will renormalize the energy levels, yes? And, to, and here, imagine that you'll have like a lot of lines, like splitting of the bands, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now if you, if you just do the unfolding, you'll reproduce a temperature dependent band structure based on the special displacement method. Uh, and here I just give some small remarks, how we evaluate the electron spectral function and from which we capture basically the band gap renormalization. So for the electron spectral function, we consider the Lehman representation. And he, you can write basically the electron spectral function as a summation over the electron band indices and the electron K wave vectors of the, the states in the supercell. Here we have the spectral weights, which is a crucial quantity that we need to evaluate for doing the affaulting. The spectral weights, they will tell you actually uh, how to affault the procedure. Uh, to evaluate the spectral weights, we have the bands and fold the routine implemented in, in PW and quantum espresso. And this routine just take advantage of the plane wave coefficients of the supercell. Given that there is a reciprocal lattice vector in the unit cell that brings the K point of the supercell back to the K point in the unit cell. So doing this summation, we have the spectral weights. Here I show also the example of temperature dependent band structure for MOS2. So, and then you can also capture the band gap normalization, the energy change of the valence band top, the conduction band minimum, take the difference and get the band gap normalization, silicon MOS2. <coughs> it seems that we give, we get a nice agreement with experiments. Some deviations also are attributed to the fact that we are missing quasi particle effects uh, or maybe unharmonicity, but yeah, silicon MOS2 are quite harmonic. Uh, here are some other applications that have already people used the special displacement method for. So people can use to calculate the current density of silicon. And here again, you see that without any phonons, you basically miss all this contribution below the direct gap. Uh, and also someone can calculate the open circuit voltage. Uh, and here you see that including electrophono coupling with the special displacement method, the agreement between theory and experiment improves considerably. Also, some other people use the method to calculate the zero point normalization within the GW method for a variety of semiconductors. And here they plot the zero point normalization versus uh, the mean frequency. Zero point normalization is the renormalization of the energy levels at zero temperature due to zero point motion. And also, here the special displacement method is quite efficient for capturing band gap normalization in nanostructure. So, imagine that if you have like now a system with 300 atoms it's a bit pointless to do density functional perturbation theory on this system. Maybe it's better to do the special displacement method, calculate the phonons with finite differences, and then apply the special displacement method to get the band gap normalization in nanostructures. Also, here people, they have used uh, the special displacement method for calculating indirect optical absorption in barium tin oxide, which is a more complex system than silicon, let's say. And barium tin oxide is also an indirect gap material. And we see that below the direct gap, they reveal absorption. And finally, because people ask Manos about what, what happens with excitonic effects, can, some, can we combine phone assisted transitions with excitonic effects? Of course we can. And here's some examples, like recent examples, where they have calculated exit of phono coupling in semiconductors using uh, the special displacement method and BSC. So here is the example of 2D germanium selenite. We see that the peaks basically are broadened and also red shifted because of the energy level renormalization. And also here comparing with experiment, if you don't account, for example, in hexane boron nitride for uh, phonon effects, you miss this broadening of, of this peak here. So without zero point, uh, without any electrophono coupling, pseudophono coupling, this peak here is like quite large, but then when you include the electrophonon effects, 
this peak is broadened and is like compatible with experimental observation. So now it's a like final points is that I compare the non-perturbative with the perturbative approach. So perturbative, it's elegant, nice, and you know you have control of every thing and you can modify it accordingly and you can do your tricks like computationally. Uh, but the non-perturbative approach comes with some advantages. Let's say here we have the non-perturbative approach calculated with the special displacement method, very good agreement with the silicon experimental uh, absorption coefficient. And also here it's the APW result by Manos. Both methods give excellent agreement with experiment, but as we have said, we, you need an empirical shift in the perturbative approach because you miss the energy level normalization. Also, when you approach the direct gap, at the state that the perturbative approach is now, it has a divergence. And this is because in the denominators, these energies will go to zero as we approach the direct gap, and this will lead to a divergence. Of course, there are terms that can be accounted for in the perturbation theory to, to eliminate this divergence, but the current state is that you might have the divergence. So in the special displacement method using ZG displacement, the absorption coefficient will account for the unassisted indirect absorption within the HBB theory plus direct absorption. So here you see that, for example, silicon, you have the full spectrum. And also will account for multiphone unassisted transitions. Some mixed terms will report the direct and indirect transition and also the band gap renormalization. Sorry for the coloring, it's, it's not my thing. So yeah. And the special displacement method is also straightforward to implement on top of any electronic structure code. So people have seen the method. They said, OK, it's very simple. Let's try it, let's say, on, on another computational package. Let's say VASP. VASP has already implemented the method, which is really good. And yeah, the, the bad thing for special displacement method, it requires supercells. <coughs> As I said before, this lacks of the elegance of the APW, where you do unit cell calculations for the electrophon matrix elements, veneer interpolation. And also it misses non-adiabatic effects, so we don't have any phonon, we don't account for any phonon emission or absorption in the optical spectra. And the last point is that, uh, that I would like to stress is that when you do calculations in supercells and you have degenerate states, most probably you will break the degeneracy especially if you use a small supercell. However, as you're going in a larger supercell, accounting for the thermal displacements, the displacements of the nuclei on average, they should respect the symmetry of the structure and they should reproduce the degeneracies. If for some reason you are using a small supercell and you break the degeneracies in a solid, in a periodic system, then maybe a good strategy would be just to take the average of the degenerate states just to find, let's say, the band of normalization. However, this is not true when you are using molecules or small clusters. So when you use small molecules and small clusters, there is a linear term entering the Allen Eine theory, actually. And as you have seen before, I've shown that during the, the physical review research paper 2020, we have shown that the linear order terms for a periodic system, because of translational invariance, they should vanish. But for molecules and small clusters, these terms exist and they are here. So here we have a linear term entering the Allen Eine theory that should be accounted for in our calculations for the band gap renormalization. So in this reference here, we show how someone can do this trick because here you, you use the generated perturbation theory to account for this term. Sorry, I didn't mention. So if you use this, uh, like you can use uh, like uh, some numerical recipe to account for this term, even in the special displacement method. So this is described in this reference here. We applied this method, let's say, for uh, graphene quantum dots. So graphene quantum dots are like spheres of graphene and then passivated with hydrogen atoms if they are freestanding. And also graphene quantum dots uh, embedded in hexagonal boron nitride. And we evaluate the zero point normalization for different size of graphene quantum dots. Here, we split the contribution between the term, the linear term due to degeneracy splitting and non-degenerate Allen Eine theory. We see that in both cases, uh, the linear term dominates the zero point normalization. And this term also dominates for very small quantum dots because this splitting will be larger for smaller systems. But as we are increasing the size, this splitting dies away. So yeah, this actually brings me to the end of my presentation. Here is a small reference list that you, know, you can go through if you are interested in the special displacement method. 
And yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention. I don't know if, if I was quick, but yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> So if we are talking about non-adiabatic effects, yes? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, non-adiabatic effects, usually they are included in the calculations uh, using, um, so I'll just find an equation. Yeah, here. So if you do the, so by definition, the special displacement method relies on the adiabatic approximation. So non-adiabatic effects, cannot incorporate it. Maybe someone can do some tricks and modify a little bit the displacement to mimic, let's say the non-adiabatic effect, but this is not rigorous. It's just, you know, an approximation. Uh, yeah, if someone does the perturbative methods like what Manos is doing, so you can include phonon on emission and phonon absorption, which is, let's say, the non-adiabatic effect in this case, or the Allen Aine theory. Uh, yeah, with the perturbative method, you can account for the non-adiabatic effects. So it's just a modification of this equation. The elegance of perturbative approaches is that you have an equation, you, you evaluate all building blocks like consham energies, optical matrix elements, electrophonon matrix elements. And then if the equation says that you need to do plus minus phonon frequency here and also in the delta function, you can do it. But with the supercell approach, because you evaluate actually these coefficients, you cannot modify these coefficients because this is the, what the calculation will give you. That's okay. So sorry, I didn't catch that. Could I divide the adiabatic effects? What do you mean, which are the adiabatic effects? Yeah, it's a adiabatic for Oppenheimer. Of metals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that we had a similar question last year. So yeah, it can be applied on metals as long as you don't really care about non-adiabatic effects. You know, someone can try. And also there are people that they got graphene and they apply the special displacement method for, you know, to see what happens to the absorption beyond the like the zero photon energy is so away from the. So it, it was successful actually, this paper. Sorry? If you unfold it, if you unfold it, if you unfold it, if that's okay, the question. So to unfold the phone, so, so here, let's say if you do the calculation in silicon or like diamond, you have the unit cell, you do the phonons, you don't really need to unfold the band structure because you do the calculation in the unit cell. So for unfolding the band structure would be necessary if you have you know, a super cell and then you introduce a defect. It's like an example I have in exercise five. So if you introduce a defect and you have a super cell and you want to see your phonon dispersion uh, unfolded in the unit cell. Yeah, that makes sense to do the unfolding. And you will learn about how to do that in the tutorial. There's exercise five, I don't know, it would be a long tutorial, so you can also do it at homework. But for these cases here, because we use periodic systems, the unit cell is enough to calculate the phones. We don't really need to do the unfolding. But if you break the translation asymmetry for any reason, because of defects or Uh, 
So it depends on the theory. Uh, let's say you have, ah, let's say you can do, so you know, people now do least square fitting and like uh, machine learning to, to, to fit the uh, coefficients. Yeah, someone could try to do that and see, you know, the portion of multiphone on it. But what I would say as a first thing to do to compare one phonon and multiphonon. So if you do finite differences and you do very small displacements, you can isolate this term, which is, let's say it's single phonon interactions. And then if you do the special displacement method and you compare the two results, you will see the effect of multiphonon processes. That's a good way to go basically for any observable. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. You really need if you know Frelich interaction is dominating in a polar material, but you really need to do like a huge supercell. But maybe it's not practical. But maybe in a few years, because you see that uh, yesterday the HPC people said, you know, we are growing. You know, people can do GPU, can do everything, thousand processors. Yeah, maybe, you know, I'm not, now I'm running actually some calculations where I use, uh, I combine Quantum Espresso with Elpa libraries, where, you know, you can, you can like modify a little bit the memory requirements in the like uh, algorithms and you can do big supercells. But still, yeah, I mean, you need larger supercells to incorporate this, this effect. And there is also a, a clever trick where you can include this term analytically. So you can account for Frelich interaction or long range effects analytically. But yeah, they, this, this is something that we, you can do. But let me also mention that, you know, long range effects will also affect your phonon dispersion, okay? This, you can do it with the special displacement method. Your phonons can account for the vibrationally induced dipole-dipole interaction effect on the phonon dispersion. But for the, let's say for the bang up normalization, you need to do something beyond and account for Frelich effect that involves the electrophonal coupling term. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So you, someone can show that those two are equivalent. Given that you don't have uh, non-adiabatic effects, you don't in the denominator of the self-energy, you don't have the plus minus phonon energy. But there, they should be equivalent. I mean, let's say the way now the code is designed, because I use this thing, the summation of a Q in B set. So yeah, I mean, if you have an inversion symmetry, like if time reversal is not respected in your system, you cannot just get the zg.x codes and apply it. You can send me an email and modify the code for you to, let's say, account for all Q points. Yeah. Time reversal. But yeah, it's doable to generate displacements. Yeah, that's 